Welcome to CivilNet. My guest is a lecturer in international relations at Dublin City University, yes, Dublin, Ireland, uh, Donacha O'Bahwain, who is today talking to us from Stepanagert, which is a long way from Ireland. And he's there because one of the issues that he's been studying for a while are the non-state actors in this region and not only in this region. Have I uh, made a proper introduction, Donacha? You have indeed, you have indeed. It's been a source of uh, academic research for me for some time now because, as you're probably aware, most people when they think of places like Karabakh, like Abkhazia, uh, they think of it uh, in, part, in terms of a larger geopolitical struggle, but I've been primarily interested in what's going on inside the countries uh, and in particular how their electoral systems work and uh, what elections are like here. Um, before I forget, please tell us where you're sitting. The background's very nice. It's actually a youth center, uh, and I'm actually, you can't see them here, but I'm surrounded by a lot of young people on, on computers. Uh, it's a resource that's, that's made available to the young people of Stephen Kurt, and fortunately they've allowed me to use their computers for the purpose of this interview. What are the young people around you saying about yesterday's process and result? Um, well, the young people right around me, I would confess, are probably too young to have a, a major interest uh, in, in the elections. They, they look about seven, eight, nine years of age. This is the kind of youth we're talking about. But in terms of the election, it certainly did garner uh, a lot of interest among people. I mean, we visited, um, uh, myself and, and, and my wife Carolina, we visited uh, 16 polling stations throughout the country, uh, including 13 villages. And uh, we were very impressed by the, um, the, the level of enthusiasm and that the, the, this, this election has um, generated throughout Karabakh. Well, what you said a little bit earlier is a little bit contradictory to my ears. You are interested in the electoral systems in places that are not considered uh, full-fledged states. Why is that? Well, I, I think it's because... We, you know, we talk about these entities as non-recognized, but life goes on anyway. I mean, we, we sometimes joke when we are in these uh, uh, types of places like Karabakh, like Abkhazia, we say, oh, look, there's an unrecognized dog crossing the road, or, you know, that's, that's rain, but can we recognize it? You know, it's, it's, it's a source of curiosity for us primarily because people are not looking at it. These elections take place irrespective of whether they're recognized by the OSC or by uh, the international community of the United Nations. And people here in Karabakh take them seriously. After all, elections are the way that people... Uh, devise mechanisms and how they will govern themselves and these take place irrespective of whether they're recognized or not and because it's very difficult to find out what these electoral processes are like coming here because you can't read about them uh, from abroad uh, that's why we decided to come here for those of us not living in Harappa, when we think Harappa, we think war or we think this you know stalemate sort of no war no peace situation what were the themes, what was the driving interest behind these elections for the voters? Was it war, no war, or was it really local, everyday, social, uh, economic issues? It was very much the latter, and I think this is something that immediately struck me. We, we traveled with all three candidates uh, along their public meetings, and this was one of the things we really wanted to get a sense of. What were the issues that people wanted to address towards their politicians during this rare occasion when they get to see them very regularly uh, you know, on their doorstep in their villages? And the issues uh, were not about war and peace. Actually, foreign affairs generally didn't, didn't even hit the radar at these public meetings. It was all you know, simple issues which are... Uh, the kind of issues that people discuss at all, in, all, in all elections all over the world. They were talking about salaries, about pensions, about the quality of their apartments, about the quality of the roads that's close to them. So it was a very, uh, you might say, normal election, and all the more uh, surprising for, the, for the, fa the fact that it takes place in such, you might say, abnormal circumstances. Living in Armenia, we're often struck by the level of incivility, non-civility, in our political processes and in our political discourse. How would you characterize the political discourse in Harappa? Um, it's a very small society, and uh, I think that that has uh, an effect that people are reluctant to criticize each other directly. So the campaign was very different from what I might have experienced in Ireland or in the United Kingdom or, or in other such countries, uh, where most people get their information about politicians via the media, and politicians every day are finding new ways to criticize their opponents. Uh, here it was quite different. Most people know people personally, they meet them on a regular basis, so you don't want to get too personal. And most of the candidates emphasized their personal biographical profiles, uh, their programs, but they generally didn't talk at each other. They talked past each other, hoping to address the electorate directly. So in that sense, it was, it was different. But I think that's symptomatic of the fact that Karabakh is such a small political society. For someone who has studied the relationships of these non-state places, um, and their relationship with the powers that claim them. 
how does this kind of election affect the resolution process, the process of trying to determine a status, an acceptable final status for Gharapakh? Oh, I think I think that the quality of the elections that, that we have seen can only assist that process. I mean, it's a well-known truism in international relations that democracies don't go to war with each other. The more democratic a society, uh, the less likely it is to, to be tempted by military endeavors. Well, certainly Karabakh has taken, I think, a major step forward with this election uh, in that democratization process. We can only hope that all parties to the conflict might take similar leaps forward. And I think if, if that were the case, certainly we could look forward with some degree of optimism uh, to a resolution of the conflict. But I think primarily people, and this is again stressing the normality of the election, people here were not looking at that dimension when, when the election was taking place. I mean, we can look at it from the outside perhaps in that way, but people here were really looking at it as a way of, of having an opportunity to interact with political figures and you know, having a choice. Uh, this is one real aspect of the election that the, the electorate were presented with two strong individuals who, you know, one representing the, you might say, the status quo and, and the continuation of that, one representing, uh, at least representing himself as an agent of change. And the electorate therefore had a real choice, and that is, again, the essence of a, of, of a good competitive democratic election. Uh, Donahue, let me ask you about the nature of the campaign, the messages, the way the campaign was run. We have, as you said, an incumbent, the president. Um, his uh, opponents were fairly well-known people, but obviously without his administrative resources. How did the campaign really go? Well, it, it was really a David and Goliath struggle. I mean, the incumbent president had, you know, the entire National Assembly behind him. He had the, the prime minister, the ministers behind him. He had no less than 40 offices throughout Karabakh. They were very, very visible, and they were filled with campaigners. Uh, so it was quite obvious that he had an organizational edge. Vitaly Balasinyan, uh, by, by contrast, had simply one office in the entirety of Karabakh. Um, However, it, it, it was testimony to the, the vigor of his campaign and the enthusiasm of his supporters that they managed to get to all sorts of isolated villages because one of the questions we asked yesterday when we went to the polling stations in really the middle of nowhere, you know, who has come here during the campaign? And what we found was that Vitaly Balasanyan always went to these isolated villages. Generally, the president uh, organized buses to bring uh, these villagers to more central places. He didn't travel there himself. Um, and I think that might have made a difference in some respects, that people respected the fact that he had made the effort to go out to these isolated places, which often don't have much connection uh, with the central authorities uh, in, in Stepanakert. So, um, so that was one major aspect. The, the, the big question, though, I think now as well is, is, is what will happen after this? Because as you may remember, in 2007, Masi Smailian uh, ran a, a campaign which was, I think, unprecedented as well, and that it had um, a strong oppositional edge to it. Um, but after that, he, he stepped back from politics and he didn't consolidate uh, the, the, the progress made, the votes gained, and there was more or less um, a ceasefire, you might say, for five years. And it's, it started now again, and, and this campaign has been much more successful. Uh, it's got one third of the vote. The real question is what will Vitaly Balasanyan do with this? Uh, one third of the electorate. Will he will he consolidate it? Will he form a new political party? That in itself might help again Karabakh's uh, rankings. You might say in 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 the democratic uh, world because as you as you're probably aware there was a controversial. Um, de-ranking of, of Karabakh from free to par uh, from partly free to, to not free um, as a result of the parliamentary elections of 2010 when no opposition party managed to, to get elected to the National Assembly. If, if, if uh, Vitaly Balasanyan was to organize such a party and if it were to gain representation uh, and be active in society, I think this would, would bode very well for the future of, of competitive politics in Karabakh. Well, we will end on that hopeful note that logic becomes more pervasive in this region and that perhaps these processes, in fact, will lead to acceptable, lasting, peaceful solutions, resolutions, and a status that is acceptable. Um, thank you very much for speaking with us. Uh, thank you very much for your take on what's happening there. And we hope to talk to you again in the weeks to come to see how these elections perhaps bring a change in the way in which local issues are resolved in Harappa.